Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habitu fi Allah continue on in our study or our brief uh, revision of Umda we reach the next hadith next uh, group of hadith in the Bab of Tahara in the chapter of Tahara the chapter of purification and this is a hadith of uh, Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an, an Abi Huraira ta radiallahu ta'ala anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal idha sharib al-qalbu fi ina'i ahidikum fil yagsil hu sab'an wuli muslim ulahunna bit turab walahu fi hadith abdillah bin mugaffal anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal إذا ولق الكلب في الإناء فاغسله سبعا وعفره ثمانة بالتراب. In these hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم, these hadith, uh, these uh, two ahadith, they affirm for us that it is an obligation to purify. The utensils that a dog licks, for example. And so in the hadith of Abu Huraira, in the first hadith, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if a dog uh, drinks from the utensils of any one of you, then you should wash it seven. Meaning wash it seven times. And in the, in the narration in Sahih Muslim, Ulahunna bitturab, the first one with dirt. And then in the hadith, the next hadith, a hadith of Abdullah bin Mugaffal, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a dog licks from the utensils of any one of you, uh, licks from a utensil, then wash it seven times. And he said, and, you know, clean, clean it the eighth time with turab. So, these groups of uh, hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they show us that it's an obligation to wash the uh, utensils that a dog has licked from seven times, and in some of the narrations, it mentions that uh, it should be done uh, one of the times should be done with dirt, and. Some of the narrations they mention, he said, فَغْزِلُوا سَبْعًا So wash it seven times in the hadith of Abdullah bin Mugaffal. And he said, وَافِرُهُ ثَمَانَةَ بِالْتُرَابِ And the eighth time with turab. So meaning that you are washing your utensil. For example, say if we have this here, and a dog licks from it. Say if there was water in here. We would pour out the water, and we would... As uh, the scholars, they also differ over the tartib, over the the order of washing, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. But as is mentioned in the in the uh, the narration of Muslim, in the first time, uh, or perhaps it may mean one of the times with tarab, and so that to wash it with sand or something like this and dirt, clean earth, and it shows us the tahura to earth as well, that the earth is pure. The earth is pure, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it Sa'id. You know, washing the, the clean earth and purifying your utensils. So you would clear, uh, clean it with sand and then wash it seven times with water. And that removes the najasa. And some of the scholars they mention that this najasa, this uh, these impurities, that it necessitates that the tongue and the licking of the the dog is uh, najis, is is impure, and and the rest of and the rest of the dog, and this is what many of the ulama hold this view that dogs are najis and that their tongue of course is nudges as it is uh the walug al al kalb that it is uh, licking from the utensil and however imam malik 
Rahmatullah alayhi rahmatul wasiyah, he differed with this. So this is why you'll find from our brothers from the who uh, follow the Maliki Madhab that in accordance with their understanding and their looking at the Nusus and dealing with the, the text, that they hold the view that the washing of the utensil is ta'abudi meaning that in and of itself it's an act of worship okay if you say it's ta'abudi so then they go on to make their argument that this is an act of worship it has nothing to do with the najasa of the kelb necessarily so then they infer from that that that's an act of worship because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded with that and that the since it's an act of worship in and of itself that the the dog itself is not najis and nor is its tongue or any part of it and even the the licking of it however it's an act of worship so this shows you and what's very important for here and i'm mentioning this mainly because uh, the Sheikh mentioned the Sheikh uh, uh, Sheikh Barak, half of Allah Taala. He mentioned this, and it just goes to show you. And I want us to learn this: that not to take such rigid views about so many issues. That you have to understand that those people who are blessed to really get into fiqh, they will understand that the scholars differ in so many masail of fiqhia. That these are, as some of the scholars mentioned, this is furur. That this is not a soul, and there are so many differences of views, and the differences come with different understanding in the nusus, the, the different understanding of the text itself. Some of the uh, scholars mean uh, maybe looking at text and thinking it's not sahih, it's not a sound text, it's not uh, authentic. Others saying no, it's authentic, and so they they have their views based upon these uh, these differences. Some of them maybe had a stronger sense in, in, in or maybe in the Arabic language or that they used the Arabic language uh, linguistically more so in explaining the hadith where another group may have used other principles in explaining those hadith and so it gives us uh, uh, it shows us that there is room for differences in many uh, ijtihadad, issues of ijtihad with the scholars. And Ahl Sunnah focuses and emphasizes and practices that which they find to be most sahih from the nusus. Going back to the text, not just saying, I'm just going to go with this madhab, if you have the ability to look outside that madhab, meaning it's a level of knowledge. But for example, someone who's raised in Pakistan, for example, and Pakistan and India and those other countries that probably surrounding countries like Bangladesh and others and, and around the world. So I think it's the one of the most widespread madhabs is that of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatul wasiya. So they, that's their background. That's how they looked at the Messiah and they are going to more than likely take uh, the view of those uh according to the madhab and what is discouraged is just to blindly follow so for example someone comes up with a sound text which goes against your issue in the in the, in the madhab because the madhab it in and of itself it may be excused you know for the way the, the viewpoint was based on knowledge and fiqh and understanding those nusus but you your view may be based just on taqlid and blind following and if you have the ability to look at those nusus or someone brings you sound strong proof and you reject it just because of your madhab because of your country because of your race and your nationality this is not going to benefit you with the loss of ta'ala and this is what ahl sunnah discourages this is the type of taqlid that we're talking about is that which goes against the nusus taking following someone else as if they are dalil my sheikh he is dalil no no sheikh is dalil again no sheikh, no scholar is dalil, no matter what. But we look to see how the scholars, when they adjudicate and they make uh, and they look into issues, 
to see the muafaka or the how they agree with the text is their viewpoint in accordance with the authenticity of the text, with the authentic text. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Nabi Muhammad.